Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. The Ministry of External Affairs has confirmed that an Indian pilot is missing in action after a MiG-21 Bison fighter plane was lost while engaging with Pakistani jets after they violated Indian airspace. Pakistani military has, however, claimed to have captured two Indian pilots, saying one of them was in hospital. MEA spokesperson Ravish Kumar said that the Pakistani planes targeted military establishments in Jammu and Kashmir but were forced to retreat by alert Indian forces. He added, Pakistan claims an Indian pilot is in their custody but we are ascertaining the facts. India had earlier on Wednesday shot down uh, a Pakistani F-16 jet that violated uh, the Indian airspace in retaliatory fire three kilometres within Pakistan territory in Lam Valley, Naushera sector. Pakistan had claimed to have entered the Indian airspace and dropped bombs. Media reports said there was no information of any casualty. A parachute was reportedly seen when the Pakistani jet went down. In wake of a tense situation after the Indian airstrikes at the JEM facility that killed several terrorists, the Army, Navy and Air Force have been put on high alert. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the new dimensions after Operation Palakot. Joining me on the programme today are... Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs. Arvind Gupta, Director, Vivekananda International Foundation. Major General Ravi Arora, Chief Editor, Indian Military Review. And Air Vice Marshal Sunil Nanodkar, Defence Expert. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Hey, Marshal, I'd like to begin the programme with you. You know, uh, how would you look at the present situation or the present uh, thing as things stand as of now? How would you look at them between India and Pakistan? Yeah, you know, this is a, a time where, uh, you know, we, uh, right, like you rightly said, we have to be on absolute alert and uh, uh, we were, uh, that is how we uh, caught, uh, you know, we caught the uh, F-16 in time and, uh, you know, did whatever is required to keep our territory safe. And uh, I think uh, it, it is very sad that, uh, you know, we lost one of our aircraft and uh, the pilot is in the custody of uh, uh, Pakistan. And uh, uh, I, I hope uh, from the uh, last lesson that we learned during Kargil and uh, the way they treated our air crew uh, which were down uh, and captured by Pakistanis, uh, I think uh, we have the example of Nachiketa coming back and telling us all about it. Uh, I think uh, now is the time that uh, we should expect Pakistan to behave like a mature st uh, state because India has not inflicted a single, uh, uh, you know, uh, violated any single rule of engagement in terms of uh, not attacking any civilian population, not uh, targeting any of their uh, targets which are of value to them. And uh, therefore, uh, this violation of uh, Pakistani aircraft uh, coming in and bombing are uh, within our territory in civilian area can escalate to an extent where uh, Pakistan can ill afford. And I think uh, all the three f services are absolutely ready for it. Right. Let me go across to uh, Mr. Arun Gupta. Now, Mr. Gupta, you know, as far as uh, the situation right now is concerned, you know, jets on either side is being shot down. Is this, uh, you know, a situation where we are looking at an undeclared war? Well, the situation is uh, certainly very delicate at this point of moment. Uh, both uh, sides have come out with uh, their official uh, statements. And if you read the uh, Pakistani statement, uh, it seems that uh, they were under pressure to uh, respond and retaliate, uh, which is what they have tried to do. And they're also talking about uh, that India should uh, give peace a chance and that uh, Pakistan does not want to go that route and uh, that uh, they uh, would like uh, the uh, they would not like to really escalate i think that is the uh, underlying test i think they have been hit very hard and uh, there is a lot of uh, problem that uh, uh, imran khan is under a lot of pressure that he is under the pakistan army is also under pressure uh, i do hope that, uh, that they would uh, weigh their uh, options uh, very carefully because they have seen that uh, india uh, is today uh, now united and uh, the leadership has uh, shown uh, tremendous uh, will and uh, India will respond. And if uh, uh, they escalate it further, the chances are that they are going to lose uh, very heavily in this. So I hope that uh, this weighs upon them 
and uh, they de-escalate the situation. You know, uh, General, everyone's been talking about de-escalation, but uh, have things escalated as of today? See, when we carried out our action, we were perfectly within our rights to do so. But what Pakistan has done, there was no reason for them to undertake this action. Let me explain. You know, when we carried out the strike, it must have been measured very carefully. Governments take hard-nosed decisions. They go through carefully about what they are going to do. And under international law and under the UN Charter, especially Article 2, Bracket 4, uh, which says you cannot violate the territorial integrity and the political independence of another signatory state, uh, but there are exceptions. The exception one is that with the permission of the UN Security Council under Article 7 in which the UN Security Council is authorized to enforce peace and we have taken part in many peacekeeping missions under Chapter 6 and 7. 7 is when you, the UN authorizes the use of force against a state and the second exception is when a state in self-defense has to carry out a preemptive strike as opposed to preventive attack. We have carried out a preventive strike which meets the conditions of the uh, UN Charter Article 51. That's where exceptions are given. And one is that the situation should be such that it is necessary, it should be immediate, the target should be specific, which has caused reason for this preemptive strike to be carried out. It does not talk of whether it should be your own territory like POK, it doesn't talk of whether it should be across the border. These are exceptions under which we have exercised the authority. And I think uh, that under all the requirements of Charter 51, we meet the requirement. Now, in response, if Pakistan has carried out a strike, they have no necessity. They have actually, they are the ones who have uh, declared war unofficially mm. by crossing over. Uh, they, they did not have the same exceptions, the reasons to attack. And uh, uh, so now it is upon Pakistan to de-escalate. Uh, we definitely will ask for our... Uh, captured uh, pilot to be returned, uh, maybe to, to make good the losses we have suffered. And if Pakistan does not behave from this moment onwards, uh, on, a, on the side I would say they have got a face saver if they were looking for one that they have shot down or uh, they have captured our pilot. I wouldn't say shot down a MiG. Uh, our MEA spokesman has said that it crashed. So now they have a face saver. And they have been so confused about our, our strike. Sometimes they have said it was in POK, not in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have said there is no damage to anybody. The bombs were dropped in an uninhabited area. So I think uh, it is upon Pakistan now to draw back and not take this any further. Sure. Uh, Ambassador, let me bring you into the picture now. You know, how has uh, India's... Diplomacy been at work ever since the Balakot uh, strike took place. You know, we saw earlier today as well a very positive uh, reaction coming out of uh, RIC in China where the RIC ministers in fact agreed on closer policy coordination to eradicate breeding grounds of terrorism is what the statement said. There has been a flurry of diplomatic activity and uh, you see, one of, the, one of the outcomes of that activity was the UNSC resolution, if you recall, which clearly named the Jaish as the perpetrator of, uh, of, uh, of the Pulwana attack, and also talked about rooting out terrorism and support, etc., without, of course, naming Pakistan. And now you have the RIC statement, which also talked about, you know, breeding grounds, as you mentioned. So I think on the diplomatic front and on the international front, <coughs> there is no doubt that... Uh, that India enjoys uh, far, almost complete support uh, and Pakistan is unable to, to take its narrative to, to any, any length uh, to, to get any support. So that is one of the things. And I think uh, you can see how Pakistan is uh, actually threatening the OIC that if uh, our EAM attends, who, has, who is a special invitee by the UAE uh, government, 
uh, that if she attends, they will boycott the OIC. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember, OIC was all about, you know, Pakistan was all about uh, Islamic Brotherhood and stuff like that. Now, even that, uh, I find that Pakistan is now, their relations with the OIC is being soured a bit. Although OIC has, uh, has indicated that uh, a, certain amount of, uh, a certain amount of concern and, and criticism of the Indian sort of strike at Balakot. So I think this is how it is going to play out. Pakistan uh, is, is not going to get much support, uh, I think, any support in my view. Because everybody now knows that Pakistan is the breeding ground of terrorism. It is the fountainhead of terrorism for many, many years. The Jaish-e Mohammed camp, you know, 15 years ago, Balakot camp was identified as a terrorist training ground. And I think this is available in, in documents, including WikiLeaks and other things. So I think you are dealing with a situation where Pakistan is in denial. And the Pakistani army, which has continuously used these proxies, you know, they... They have built up almost 60, 65 such organizations right. uh, who depend, you know, in the terms of, uh, you know, jihadi organizations who, who have to conduct jihad in either Afghanistan and who have to conduct jihad in India, of course. And India, of course, they are fed with all those, uh, all those stupid kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, rhetoric about Gazwa, Hind and things, stuff like that. And sure. then even in Iran, uh, you know, they have... They have uh, uh, unleashed uh, this Jaish al Adal, which, which actually also hit the Republican, uh, you know, forces in in uh, in Iran on the same day that they hit Pulwana. The these guys, Jaish e Mohammed guys, hit Pulwana. So I think Pakistan is now a known uh, known, uh, you know, perpetrator of terrorism. It is in the dock for terrorism, and of course, it is flailing its arms and trying to sort of seek support and talking, divert attention to Kashmir and all these things. So they will try their own bit about all this. But I don't think they are going to succeed this time. Sure. All right. Uh, you know, uh, in our next segment now, I'd like to concentrate on our missing IAF pilot. And M. Marshall, I'd like to begin with you first, of course, now that we know that the IAF pilot has been captured by Pakistan, or so Pakistan says, can we expect Islamabad to adhere to the Geneva Conventions? You know, actually... Uh uh, we we should we actually uh, should expect pakistan to behave in this case very much mat uh, maturely because uh, we had uh, proof of what they did to the pilot uh, uh, in the past uh, who were captured and we have first hand information being uh, given to the entire nation and to the world by uh, uh, nachiketa who came back uh, you know safe and sound from there having been uh, tortured for many days so now that Pakistan has openly claimed that they have captured this pilot and there are, uh, you know, kind of proofs available, MEA has said that uh, the pilot was missing in the afternoon. But uh, now we have some, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, pictures floating around. And if we were to believe those pictures, and I think uh, there will be uh, exchange of information on this very shortly and we'll come to know what the exact facts are. The nation... Uh, which is under the UN Charter is supposed to follow every bit of it. And uh, I think with that respect, I think they should follow the Geneva Convention, take the information that is uh, basic necessity to know who uh, that person is, where he belongs to, and thereafter treat him well and hand it over back to our nation. But the track record of Pakistan has not been good in the past. So why do you expect that to change this time around? See, we have got a 50-50 uh, record of one pilot being killed, ha ha having captured, and one pilot being uh, not treated too well uh, and thereafter handed over to the country. So we presume that they are, uh, you know, uh, they, they understand what it means uh, uh, to us to get our boys back uh, who have been captured during war. And we have played a much, much bigger and major role in 71 operations in the kind of numbers that we have sent them back safe and sound, having looked after them well, uh, having uh, been uh, captured as prisoners of war. So therefore, it is now time for Pakistan to prove what kind of seriousness they have when they have to be called some kind of mature na uh, nation in this uh, re uh, regard. So Pakistan must return the goodwill is what you are suggesting that India has shown in the past. 
Hey Marshall, thank you for being with us on the program. I know you have to be elsewhere. I'm going to let you go now and uh, continue the discussion. Thank All you. All right, uh, Mr. Gupta, uh, you know, talking about the Geneva Conventions, of course, what do the Geneva Conventions state and what's important to note? I think uh, there are uh, very detailed uh, protocols and there are duties and obligations on uh, the countries involved to treat uh, the prisoners of war in a particular way. And in today's uh, day and age, when Pakistan has actually been exposed, violating many aspects of international law, including that of uh, 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 supporting terrorism, I think they will be further exposed if they do not uh, adhere to the Geneva Conventions, which uh, require them to give humane treatment to the uh, captured uh, person and also to return it to, to the country concerned as soon as possible. If they don't do that, they are already violating uh, terrorism uh, laws and uh, resolutions. Uh, also, the FATF has also named them as a country of concern because they are not stopping and preventing the, uh, the financing of terrorism. And this will be another uh, uh, issue on which they will be exposing themselves if they do not act according to the Geneva Convention. General, uh, can we expect Pakistan to use the captured IAF pilot as leverage? What is it that they'd be looking for in return? They know the rules very clearly, as we do. Uh, there is a fallacy that the Geneva Conventions apply only in war conditions or when war has been declared between two nations mm. formally. Well, that is not so. The four parts of the Geneva Convention apply to armed conflict even when one side does not recognize that they are in a state of conflict with the other. It doesn't talk about war as such. And these four uh, parts of the Geneva Convention, the first one applies to all sick and wounded armed forces personnel in the field. Second one to all sick and wounded armed forces personnel at sea. The third to prisoners of war and those who have been detained. It so happens that some people in the country may have been detained because of the hostilities. And the fourth one is against civilians who are not part of the conflict. So, and what it requires, first thing, which they have already violated, is parading him and circulating the videos. Mm. You cannot parade prisoners of war for propaganda. That's what they have done. I have also seen the video and it appears he has uh, uh, serious injuries on his face. He's perfectly all right otherwise and it appears this is as a result of violence after he was captured. Mm. So uh, it would be good. Maybe they can give the excuse that they were in the custody of uh, local people who captured him. But once he is in, he, but the government has already announced, Pakistan government has announced that he is in their custody. So maybe it's the first day and the Indian government would have already conveyed to them that he must be treated as per Geneva Conventions. They are going to dispute that he is not a prisoner of war, yeah. Yeah. that he is a criminal and he will be tried and treated accordingly, which is not so. It will become an uh, issue of dispute. But Geneva Convention is very clear and then it details out how prisoners of war or detained persons or wounded persons are going to be uh, treated. Uh, this is one of those conditions of armed conflict where one side perhaps did not recognize. But the fact is that we are in a state of armed conflict or hostility with each other and they perfectly apply. and. Uh, I have a feeling this will become a major emotive issue between the two countries. It already is. It already is an emotive issue as it stands at the moment. But, uh, you know, Ambassador, what happens if a country does not adhere to the Geneva Conventions? Well, Pakistan can be taken to the International Court of Justice. The UN uh, Security Council can pass... Uh, Past resolution sanctioning Pakistan, so it can lead to a lot of uh, lot of repercussions if Pakistan doesn't adhere to the Geneva Convention. And Pakistan, having claimed that the, it, he the our pilot is in their custody, officially they have claimed. So I think now it devolves on them to act responsibly and and adhere to the Geneva Convention. 
but uh, once uh, but once that and uh, one more point which i must add they cannot treat him as an ordinary person or a criminal he he was flying an indian air force aircraft he's he was uh, he's he has been captured with an uh, indian air force a uniform with his name and his uh, everything that all the gear that a pilot has carries including his name etc and the fact and there is no doubt that he belongs to the indian air force and the fact that he is in uniform is an added factor that pakistan cannot now say that we will not follow the geneva convention it is quite clear that pakistan knows these rules and i think if they violate it uh, there will be repercussions for pakistan uh, internationally as well as uh, you know how india will react to if if anything uh, untoward happens to our uh, our pilot so sure. all right uh, uh, try and get some closing comments now in from all my guests starting first with you mr gupta you know uh, now that the pilot has been captured what must we do to ensure that we get him back no i think uh, uh, we must take up the matter uh, with the pakistan government uh, at the earliest which uh, we must have taken and i think uh, they should be uh, told that if they do not uh, uh, adhere to their obligations under the geneva convention this would have repercussions for them and thirdly if need be the international community can also be uh, apprised of uh, the situation and uh, they they should also be uh, asked to put pressure on pakistan to give humane treatment to the captured pilot and return it to india as soon as possible right and uh, general see, i see a long journey ahead uh, before the pilot is returned all past cases have shown that it has mainly been a trade off uh, when we capture somebody when somebody strays across somebody important and then we exchange that mutual exchange goes on i suppose we already have some people in indian jails uh, pakistanis in indian jails uh against whom uh, a trade off will take place that remains to be seen but right now india must talk to pakistan from a position of strength they have done the right thing they have not done anything wrong and they must demand for his repatriation and otherwise even if they have to threaten pakistan with further action pakistan has already been shamed particularly the pakistan armed forces and they are going to be wary of any further black mark on them uh, through indian action so the uh, it has to be a strategy in cooperating both the stick and the carrot and but in all likelihood do you believe that it's going to be a trade off at some point in time well personally i feel so all right and uh, also uh, you know general do you fear there could be a further escalation in the hours or the days to come i don't see any further escalation taking place pakistan is in no position economically militarily and from the environment that is existing worldwide diplomatically the pressure that they are under especially because china has not supported pakistan and uh, i feel also maybe the ambassador will say more on this that uh, china is uh, more interested in india in this case rather than pakistan and at the right time our foreign minister is there and perhaps we could talk to china about putting pressure on pakistan giving away some of the uh, you know sops to china china is very interested in india's support as far as the belt and road initiative mm -hmm. goes and many other things so i think the key lies in china yeah ambassador definitely your your take on china as well and are you surprised at how china has reacted really to the whole situation after the balakot operation and also what are india's diplomatic options going forward well china has reacted with uh, with uh, in a low key manner it has certainly not supported pakistan and it is it is called uh, on both countries and in fact the new resolution that the ric has passed the statement uh, clearly talks about uh, a sort of a worldwide fight against terrorism and its breeding ground now china is clearly indicating that uh, pakistan is the breeding ground 
And don't forget that China itself has been a victim uh, of Pakistani terrorism, particularly in its Xinjiang province, where the Uyghurs, where they, of course, the Uyghurs have a, have a different problem, who are Muslims. And China is already, you know, uh, taking action against the Uyghurs, which is, of course, uh, very undemocratic, you know, detention camps, etc. But then uh, the, the Uyghurs have also uh, received support from Pakistani terrorists, and Pakistani terrorists have gone there also. So I think Pakistan, uh, Pakistan has come under pressure in the past from China. And also, ultimately, if there is escalation and if there is war, then don't forget that China will lose everything they have invested in Pakistan. I mean, that will be the end of their BRI or the CPEC as far as uh, China is concerned. And I don't think China would want to do that because it's a strategic investment. So I think they will be cautioning Pakistan on, uh, on, this, on, on, on this issue. And will certainly tell, I'm sure they will certainly tell them, hey, please do not escalate it any further. All right. A quick closing comment before I wrap up the show from you, Mr. Gupta. Yes, I think uh, this China factor is uh, very important. Uh, the, we know that the China-Pakistan uh, uh, access uh, is very strong. But this is now a new situation altogether. And we have a, a new security environment. And this is also a chance for China to redeem itself and perhaps make some uh, new initiatives and try and revise its relationship uh, with Pakistan and actually see that terrorism is a very serious problem. It could threaten uh, China. It could threaten India. It has threatened India. And uh, China can uh, now make uh, a new beginning in its uh, relationship with Pakistan and with India. I think this is a chance for them. All right. It's a chance, really, as far as uh, the uh, countries in the region are concerned, is what the panelists are suggesting. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.